Hello, and welcome to Joy in the City's Easter special, brought to you by ABC 23 and Fox 8. As we celebrate Easter during these unprecedented times, one question seems increasingly more important. What is the true meaning of Easter? Today, more than 20 pastors from our community join together in a collective response to the significance of the Easter holiday. This program is sponsored by ABC 23 and Fox 8. Easter is a holiday we are all familiar with. Kids may think it's about chocolate bunnies and baskets, but Easter is the foundation of why we in the faith community exist. Today, you will hear from many pastors and leaders on different aspects of this holiday. We begin the program with Jesus' backstory from 2,000 years ago. God desires a relationship with, with people. Uh, he created us for relationship with Him. Uh, sin severed that relationship in the garden. Uh, when God came down and to walk in the cold of the day, Adam and Eve were hiding because of sin. And, uh, and along with that, the shame and all that goes along with that. But uh, that relationship with God and, and, and people, was, that was severed. And so God had a plan. And so throughout the Bible, I like to call it that, that, that uh, thread that is woven from Genesis to Revelation, uh, that God has a plan to reunite God with people, with his creation. And the way that that plan came about was providing a perfect sacrifice. Uh, someone to take our sins, to take our place, so that we can be reconciled back to God. Church historians believe that prior to Jesus coming into Jerusalem, they believe there was also a triumphal entry of Pilate coming into the city. It was the Passover, there was a lot of hubbub, and the Passover, there could have always been some tension or what have you. The Jews really uh, were disliked, the Gentiles, and the city was always in a, in a hubbub. So Rome had put Pilate in charge of that, but Pilate didn't live there. Pilate lived in Caesarea, which is on the coast. And so it seems, according to church history, Pilate would come into the city the day uh, prior, the, the, the Sunday prior, our Sunday, prior to the Passover. And so it's believed perhaps by some scholars and historians that he rode in from the West Gate, which was his tradition, but then there's a processional coming from the East Side with Jesus and the, 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 the uh, uh, correlation between the two and the contrast between the two because the Jews hated the Romans. They hated Pilate. And so now they're seeing Jesus as perhaps their king because he had healed them. He had ministered to them. Miracles. And so here's this deal. So to me, that just even elevates this whole Passion Week even more. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, it was the day the Jewish people picked the lamb to be the sacrifice. Uh, so he was presenting himself that day. Here I am, I am the Lamb of God. They missed that to their loss, but that's what he was. And the people, as he was coming in, the people were coming out and they were gathering around him and they were shouting and singing and they were worshiping him and, and they were waving palm branches as a sign of worship. And as he rode in, they were putting those palm branches before him and they were throwing their coats before him and just to celebrate Jesus coming in. But what's interesting to me about that whole thing is they kind of had a little bit different of a view of Jesus than maybe what his purpose was at that moment. Because they saw Jesus coming in as someone who was going to their Messiah that was going to break them free from the governments of the world and, you know, the set them free from the Romans and, and just set up the kingdom there on earth and just kind of be a political earthly king. But Jesus' purpose in that moment, he came humbly because not to set up necessarily his kingdom on the earth, the overthrow the governments of the world, but really to save the people from their sins. And so those people were, were almost, those who were praising him one minute were those who were shouting crucify him at the cross. And so his purpose was 
uh, to come and save the world, but the people almost missed that, that point of it. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2.22 that Jesus Christ did not sin or even tell a lie. His character was impeccable. So we continue as we hear from several pastors about the purpose in which Jesus lived this kind of life while here on earth. I think how he always led with integrity and humility. He stuck to what he said. He meant what he said, said what he meant. And he led as a servant. Uh, he showed love to the least lovable and served them in the very best way uh, that he could. You know, he lived a life that I believe all of us should try to strive to live. The life of Christ to me exemplifies the life that we can have. I, you know, when we look at Jesus, we look at a righteous and holy and, and good man, uh, the, the Son of God. And even though we're, we're, not, we're not the Son of God, He lived a life in a way that we should exemplify, that we should, that we should mimic. And it's interesting that when Jesus was on His, walking His earthly ministry, when John the Baptist saw Him, He said these words, He said, Look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus' purpose was to come and lay down his life and be that sacrifice, that one final sacrifice for all of us. There didn't need to be that sacrificial system over and over again because Jesus was the final. This is when hope entered the world in human form. This is when God, you know, came here, message translation, like moved into the neighborhood, right? Like, this is the turning point for eternity. The whole point of Jesus' life, the 33 years he lived on this earth, was so that he could go to the cross, not just to die, but to die, be buried, and to rise again. So I think you need to look at the whole finished work of Christ on the cross. If he would have just lived those 33 years and died, he'd be just like anybody else. Uh, but what we do know is that he lived those 33 years on this earth without sin. And then he died, and three days later, he rose again. He rose again to show that, yes, God does have the power over death, which then means God has the power over sin. The reason we die is because of sin. You go back to Genesis chapter 3, and you see Adam's sin there. Mankind sinned. Uh, death came upon all men. But with Jesus dying and rising again, the perfect spotless lamb, as was stated in John 1, 27, behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You know, you think about that. We needed that spotless lamb to die, but not just to do that, but to overcome the reason that we have death. And that's why uh, we celebrate Easter, the whole finished work of Christ on the cross. Uh, the Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And so Christ was nailed to the cross, and on the cross, the Bible says that his blood flowed. And as that blood flowed, it was a representation of the blood cleansing and forgiving the sins of mankind. And so without the cross, there really is no hope of a resurrection, because all of our sins would still be there without forgiveness. And it had to take him shedding his blood on that cross to bring forgiveness, to bring hope into our lives. You can't have a real celebration of Easter unless you realize Jesus died on the cross. Unless you have the ugliness and the, hor the horror. Uh, that, that word excruciating comes from the actual act of crucifixion. The, the Roman act of crucifixion uh, includes that word in excruciating. It comes from that, the etymology of the word. And so when we realize the excruciating uh, terror of the cross, it's one of incredible contrasts, and we don't get it if we only get the resurrection. If we only get the resurrection, as triumphant and as glorious as it is, it becomes a hundred, a thousand times more triumphant and glorious when you realize it's in contrast to the excruciating death that Jesus did, died on the cross. As horrific and incomprehensible as the crucifixion was, we can thank God that the story doesn't end there. The resurrection is the next chapter in the passion story of Jesus. Easter is that moment in time. I've heard it described as a fulcrum. You know, it's, it's that moment in time that everything in history uh, hinges on. You know, everything before led up to that. 
of course now we look back to that because it's that moment when um, when Jesus Christ uh, was victorious over over our greatest enemy you know and and it's 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 Easter that makes sense of uh, you know, death, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? We look back to Easter that illustrates uh, the fact that, uh, that death is not uh, the end, uh, but there's something beyond. When I look at Resurrection Sunday, I like to tie it into the Old Testament because what we know is Jesus is our high priest and he was the last high priest to make the last offering for sin, which was himself. And I believe that when Jesus was buried in the tomb, that is a picture of the high priest taking the offering, the blood of the lamb, into the most holy place where the blood was offered. God accepted the offering. And then the high priest came back out of the most holy place. And the people in the Old Testament knew their sins were atoned for. The picture of the resurrection is Jesus, the high priest, going into the tomb, offering the blood to God on our behalf for our sin, God accepting the sacrifice and the priest. And when he comes back out of that tomb, it's God saying, I've accepted this priest and I've accepted his offering and now our sins are forgiven. In fact, what's interesting is, you know, we talk about the resurrection and looking at the resurrection. But nobody ever really saw the resurrection. All we ever saw was the empty tomb. The stone was rolled away, not so that he could get out, the stone was rolled away so we could get in to see he wasn't there anymore. Remembering that there was that day when the women discovered the tomb was empty, they were given the, the charge to go back and tell the disciples. And then when Peter and John got to the tomb, they discovered the tomb is empty. Where was that body that was placed in the tomb on that Friday afternoon or evening? And then to experience Jesus coming among them not as a ghost, but as someone who was real, who they could they could touch the wounds in his hands and his side, who, who ate with them. To experience that God power over death itself. I love that, that the man who knew no sin became sin for all of us, but it didn't stop there. He then went to that next level and he took the keys of death and Hades and he overcame it. And then he says to us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You now go therefore. You now go therefore. Preach the gospel, make disciples, heal the sick, raise the dead. These are, this is the commission. We can't do that without the power of the resurrection. And humanity changes on the day Jesus Christ walks out of that tomb. All of humanity changes because we have this opportunity to be restored to our Creator in a new and significant way by a Holy Spirit that we don't still don't understand, but we have. And we have its power, and we have its influence, and we have its grace, and we have its love, and we have all those things that support us in this life in a new way, that we can take all the failures of our past and wash them away and walk in a new way that the eternity that Jesus Christ promises us begins today. These pastors talk about our life being changed because of what Jesus did through dying on the cross and the resurrection. Eternal life with Christ is something available for every person on the face of the earth today. Salvation isn't just for those who have it all together. It's not just for a certain race or, or even a certain denomination. It's available for you. As a matter of fact, John 3.16 says, God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. It continues in verse 17 by saying, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Also, 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. You may say today, it can't be that simple, but it is. Every one of these men and women here have been right where you are. But by accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, their lives have been transformed. As a matter of fact, if you want to respond today to this message of salvation through Jesus, I want to hear about it. I want you to know that we love you and we want to hear from you. The best way to contact us right now is through stories at jointhecity.org. That's the easiest way to reach people nowadays. But I tell you this, 
Either myself or one of the pastors from this program will respond to you as soon as possible. As we've gathered all these pastors together for this program, we also developed a story that is a collective spoken word of the struggle many find in accepting Jesus into their lives. This may be you, so please take a moment to watch this. There I was, lost and alone. Reality was dismal, a life not my own. Each day empty of hope, but full of anxiety. Waking in fear, filled with uncertainty. Nowhere to turn, no one to call. Not one who will rise up to be there when I fall. But God. When I was a little boy. When I was a little girl. I had dreams of one day impacting our world. Moved by a purpose cause or significance. I wanted to be that one, they said. Made a difference. I've tried so hard, but seem to always fail. I'm not doing well. Can't you see I'm quite frail? Everyone around me is enjoying success. And I'm here drowning in my self-made mess. I know it's time to change, for today's a new day. But no one around to guide me, to show me the way. But, but God. God. A man told me God sent his son for you and for me. Not just give me life, but life more abundantly. For God created time, the beginning and the end. But wants a relationship with you, for he calls you his friend. John 3.16 says God loves you and you are worth his life. Which is why Jesus died and became the ultimate sacrifice. Not because of what you've said, done, or what you've accomplished. But because of his great grace, he provides what he's promised. For he is knowable, relatable, remarkable, and unshakable. For his existence is persistence, and you hearing this is no coincidence. For he is wonderful, counselor, mighty God, and father, forgiver, healer, and like him, there is no other. I said, but wait. Does he know I've cheated, robbed, lied, and abandoned? Does he know me, the, the real me? I'm not a good man. I've done things and said things to hurt many people. I don't see how he can love me, for in my eyes, I'm evil. He said, but God sent Jesus. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. Today is your day of salvation, no longer lost in sin. Jesus stands at the door of your heart, knocking, asking to come in. I went from hopelessness to hope, from hurt to healed, from brokenness to be made whole. In me, Christ is revealed. I used to be the person many said was flawed. But now when they say, why the difference? My story is my response. And it begins with. And it begins with. And it begins with. And it begins with. Bless God. We will return to our program in a few minutes. Joy in the City is a weekly program produced for television and social media, highlighting people and organizations having an impact on our community. If you aren't familiar with our program, be sure to visit our previous episodes on Facebook or YouTube by searching Joy in the City. Now back to our Easter special, brought to you by ABC 23 and Fox 8. Since the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is something we should celebrate every day, I wanted to dig a little deeper into the mission of Jesus for the church in our modern culture. The Great Commission is Jesus' Jesus final words to the people here on earth before he ascended into heaven, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's our call, that's our identity, and that's our purpose as the church uh, in the here and the now, in the past, and especially into the future. Where does the Great Commission begin? It begins right at our own town. You know, there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, one of the elements of the Great Commission teaches us that we are to start in our own Jerusalem. And uh, so often when we, th when we think of the Great Commission, we think of reaching the people with the gospel in Ecuador or over in India or whatever the case, and that's important. But we are also to be starting here at home, taking the gospel to the people, not only in the highways and the hedges of life, when I think of that, I think of the country, but up and down the alleys and the streets of our cities. 
we need to do more in getting out the Word of God of the Gospel to those who need it. I've always understood that uh, that commission in two ways. One is, uh, you know, thank God for those people that, that pull up their lives and go to some remote part of the world and, and, uh, uh, and do mission work that way. But it's also a commission for all of us because uh, I heard somebody say one time that, that the, the phrase go into all the world could also be translated as you go into the world. You know, Jesus said in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the, the earth, and thank God that people go all around the world. But you know, as we go, uh, the commission is still given to all of us uh, to share the message of Christ uh, with, uh, with everyone around us. I think it looks like being Jesus. It looks like carrying the Holy Spirit with us and walking by the Spirit. And so that doesn't mean that we have to just be in church or that we have to have prepared something to say. It means that we embody that, that we carry the Holy Spirit with us. And at any moment we can give an answer for why we have peace, especially now in the middle of so much fear and anxiety. Um, so it looks like being ready to say things or looking for opportunities. It's not always that someone's gonna ask us. It's looking for an opportunity to say, you just seem really anxious. Can I pray for you? Or can I tell you why I have peace? And so it's being ready to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever you are. And I believe as a pastor, that word is the living word of today. So there really is no choice about it. Jesus says, go unto all the world. And, and preach my gospel. And we do that by certainly preaching God's word uh, through the Bible, because it is a living word, the living flesh of Jesus. And we also do that by serving Christ with our head, our hands, our feet, and most of all, our heart. And we do that through feeding other people, um, building relationships with them so that prayerfully that they will come to know the salvation power of Jesus Christ. We do that for like taking care of their, a child's feet, you know, if they need a new pair of shoes uh, or somebody, today's not a good day to talk about it, but if somebody just needs a hug or a gesture of love, that's what God calls us into the world to do is to share that great commission. And it's not a choice, it is a mandate. I say, I would say at the end of the day, Aside from making sure that personally you are living in a way to honor Jesus, this is the the utmost mission of the church. It is the most important thing we can do. Uh, we go and make disciples. We, we're not just focusing on the people that are that are in the building or the people that we're already connected to, but we're doing our very best to share the good news with other people. Uh, that's one of those. There's that video by uh, Penn Jillette from several years ago where he talked about a man at one of his shows came and, and brought him a, a Bible. And... I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we, uh, we talk to folks and, you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the um, what I call the hover position after I was all done, big guy, probably about my age. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. Little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of. Uh, proselytizing and then he said I'm a businessman I'm I'm sane I'm not crazy and he looked me right in the eye and did all of this and uh, it was really wonderful I believe he knew 
that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible. But I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. That whole that thought just sticks with me, that if we really believe what we're talking about, how can we do anything other than try to point people in that direction? Uh, because we know, you know, it's very... Even even now, in current situations, circumstances, what we're facing in life, we're very much reminded of how, how special and how precious life is. We know that we get one of these, but we also believe that this is not all there is. And so we, in loving people, we should want to do everything that we can to help people know Jesus and better follow Jesus and live fully devoted to Jesus. I mean, that's what, that's what we hold to. I believe it was Jim Putman that said, what if... Uh, the life that Jesus lived is just as divine as the words that he spoke. We like the red letters, uh, but what if the life that he lived is just as divine? And we see Jesus spending the majority of his time with three and with twelve. And uh, his final words to his disciples uh, wasn't so much go and gather large crowds as much, although that would be part of it, it was go and do with others what I have done with you. And the greatest impact that we can have as a church is mobilizing disciples. If everyone walks with one person until they get to the point where they're walking with another person, that's where the true multiplication happens and movement begins to take place. And so as churches, we have the opportunity to, to go into our communities, to send missionaries around the world. And the opportunity that I see given to us is one that allows for us to be who we are, who God created us to be. Because I can't go into a public high school and win teenagers for the Lord. I can't go into a place of business where somebody else works. But those people that work there, those students that go to school there, they have a great mission field right in front of them. And so they're able to go in and be a light, be a witness uh, wherever they go. And so the great commission for us to go is just simply that, go. Stop just sitting back and taking everything in. Use what God has given you. Use the word that's in your life. Use your testimony. And I think sometimes we get scared about going, but really, it really is all about our own personal testimony. Just share your testimony with somebody, and that will engage them into recognizing who Christ is in your life, and they'll say, ooh, maybe I want him in my life too. We would like to thank ABC 23 and Fox 8 for partnering with Join the City to develop this Easter special. Also, we want to thank our platinum sponsor, Harry's Construction, and our studio sponsors, Park Home and Taylor Design and Events, for faithfully supporting the community-wide efforts of Joy in the City. 
Today's platinum sponsor is Harry's Construction, whose motto is, if you can dream it, we can create it. Recently opening Harry's Construction Kitchen and Bath Center so you, the consumer, can see examples of the variety of services provided by the team at Harry's Construction. Regardless of the project size, Harry's team approaches each project as if it is his own home. Be sure to visit Harry's Construction Kitchen and Bath Center at 114 Main Street in Bellwood. You can also visit their website to see pictures of home improvement projects over the years. Thanks again to Harry Halk and the team for supporting Joy in the City. Now back to our Easter special. The life of someone who is a follower of Jesus looks a little different. Not just in what we do or what we say, but in our everyday actions our words, our countenance, or even our attitude. Area pastors continue as they tell us what this should look like when our hope and trust is in Jesus. I believe that it means putting aside all of us, laying down our own desires, our own passions, things that we wanna do, and ultimately about serving other people and showing and expressing that love of God to people uh, that are insecure or feel hopeless uh, or need that inspiration and encouragement. Doing all that you can going above and beyond uh, for other people, being a model for Jesus here on earth. I think of Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27 that tells us that we are to have the lifestyle that makes the gospel of Christ. We go back to the gospel, don't we? That makes the gospel of Christ becoming. When people see us, they should see the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we are a peculiar people. It doesn't mean we're weird. Uh, some, some of us might be. When you've got a name like Dull, you are. But um, it means that we're outstanding. We're unique, as it were. The reason we are unique is because we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and we are here to be representatives of His. We are His ambassadors. And so in our life, whether it's what we say, what we do, where we go, we should be reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, it was uh, George Barna, I believe, a number of years ago, did a survey. And he found that in many places and in many ways, the lifestyle of the believer is so close to the lifestyle of the unbeliever that you can hardly tell the difference in many of the categories. We should see to it as Christians that our life radiates Jesus Christ. And it will if we are allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us and to control us on a day-by-day -day basis, which simply takes simple obedience, saying no to sin and self, and yes to God and His Word, then the Spirit of God will produce in us the fruit of the Spirit that will enable Christ to be seen through us. At the base level, you would see like someone who's, who has surrendered their life to Jesus would grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all the list, right? The fruits of the Spirit that, that you would see uh, more and more of that, that someone who used to be very angry is growing is more and more peaceful. Uh, someone who's very cynical is, is now more hopeful. Like that's, that's one, uh, one way that you would see that, that people uh, are being transformed, that, that they reflect the values and the, the aspects of the kingdom. Like I just think these are kingdom things, right? Someone who is um, prone to addiction is now someone who has self-control and it's well, where else could it have come from? But that God has broken into your life. I think typically before Christ, we're living life for ourselves, and that can look selfishly. It can look um, that we get um, just involved with whatever things our heart desires. So if that ends up being drugs, alcohol, sex, um, being popular, all of those things. I think after Christ comes into it, our lives. Um, it's not that some of those things are not still temptations for us, but I do believe that um, 
there's a freedom that we can be set free from those things that that um, that God can make us full and whole um, on our own, or, or with Him we can feel that freedom. And so instead of being motivated by those things, we're we're set free to really live the purpose that God has for our lives. See, when you truly accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, I mean, a lot of people, they like the Savior part, but the Lord part is, is harder because that means we're submitting our whole life to Him. And so that's what it means. Salvation means we're, we're taking on, Jesus is, uh, is forgiving us, washing us of our sins, but then we grow then it's a responsibility for all of us to walk out what that means. It's not just a one-time experience that we say a prayer and then we just walk away from it. No, it's a lifetime of a commitment and lordship of Jesus in our life. Well, I think one of the greatest things it should give us is confidence. All right, the confidence that he is our high priest, the confidence that he made the only acceptable offering for sin, that he paid for it, and now I walk confident. The Bible says what? That I come into the throne room of grace, the throne room of God, by what Jesus did at Calvary and through the resurrection. And so I come boldly into the throne room, but not in arrogance, but in confidence because of what he did. And so there's a confidence in my life that I don't get stuck into legalisms of it being Jesus on Calvary plus what I eat, what I don't eat. Jesus at Calvary plus what I wear, what I don't wear. Uh, those types of things that lead to legalism. So now I walk in confidence knowing he made that offering. Then we come to the point of the resurrection and we see the resurrection. That is the empowerment for us to overcome because sin will come back, temptation will come back, the, the trials are gonna be there. That's life, that's what happens. Um, but through the resurrection and ultimately the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, is the thing that empowers us to live a victorious life. Paul said that we're more than conquerors in Christ. And so if we understand that we become more than conquerors, then we're overcomers. And we, can't, we shouldn't be afraid. We can't be afraid. In these days, it's a time for us to rise up. And so not to have that spirit of fear, but of scripture says power, love, and a sound mind. And I, I see with that resurrection, uh, for every believer, it impacts us so deeply, if we will allow it to. Being that I was raised, each of us have a little bit of dysfunction, at least in our family. I might have a little bit more, but um, here's how it played out in my life. I was trying to find love, support, in humankind, those things around me. I had this empty space in my heart, and nothing could fill it. And the only time it could be filled is when I was speaking to a pastor. And at that time, I received Jesus as my Savior, but I didn't know the full embodiment of the Holy Spirit. And at that time, we prayed together, and God's love, God's healing, filled that empty space in me. And I still feel my heart is... Um, John Wesley would say, my heart was strangely warmed. And I still get a sense of what it was like even today, maybe 15 years later. It was a transformational moment for me because Christ's spirit connected with my spirit. God's spirit connected with my spirit. With that, I was changed to be more forgiving, more loving, more patient, more kindness gentleness, self-control, all of those things that come from being connected to the Spirit. And I think that's the marks of a person who is in Christ today. When people see us on the street, they see those actions, those attitudes coming from us. If we look at transformation through Christ, we're looking at a whole new life. Um, I think oftentimes people, we walk in our own, our old identity. Um, whether it was a past failure, a past addiction, a past sin that we struggled with for so for so long, and and here now we receive Christ, we we walk away from those things and we're living a new life. Um, so I think dropping just our old identity, no longer picking that up and carrying that with us, um, can really set the example of what Jesus can do for others. Fearless and full of joy. Um, 
There's a pestilence out there that's killing people and it's terrible and it's sad and it's scary. And it's gonna affect people that we know, people that we love. But we who are in Christ need to walk in a fearless way toward those who may not and are full of fear and are full of inhibitions and are full of this just terror that's happening in our land. And we have this life that we can speak to them that we don't know what's going to happen, but we do know this, that we belong to Jesus Christ. And once we're in his hand, we'll never be let go. And would you like to be in his hand with me? If anyone is in Christ, the, the, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. It is an actual reality. I'm a, I'm a totally different person. I may have been uh, redeemed and saved or given my life to Christ two hours ago, and I am in. I am a different person. Having said that, 20 years from now, I should be different than I am today. So it is, it is at once and it is the future and that life is transformed immediately and yet it's transformed gradually and who do I begin to look like? I begin to look like Jesus and you, be, you, you resemble that upon which you focus and you resemble those upon whom you look and if you're looking to Jesus, which we're encouraged to do, then we'll begin to look more and more like him. That's a transformed person. When I think about Easter, um, two words can come to mind, uh, the word hope and the word victory. Uh, and, and I take those out of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the wonderful resurrection chapter. Uh, in there, Paul says that if Christ be not raised, if there is no resurrection, what happens if there, if there would be no Easter? Um, what Paul says is that we are still in our sins and we are to be people that are to be pitied. Um, because there is no hope if there's no resurrection. But because of Jesus Christ and his resurrection and his defeating Satan, sin, hell, uh, the grave, we can have this wonderful hope that there is, uh, there is hope beyond the grave. There is hope beyond corona. There is hope beyond our situations and our experiences. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. So for me, one is the resurrection gives us great hope. Uh, secondly, though, uh, it, there's great victory. Uh, at the end of that chapter, uh, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And uh, everyone likes to win. And uh, for those of us who put our trust in Jesus Christ, we win in the end. And I think the, those two words are, uh, have, are, are really key even to our time today uh, with all that we're going through uh, with this virus and everything. Uh, there are people who are looking for hope. Uh, for a long time, people can try to fill that hope with all kinds of things, but it, it falls way short. And, and so we can have hope in Jesus Christ because, hey, he conquered, he conquered the grave. He rose again. And, uh, and we can have victory. Uh, we can have victory over sin, over Satan, over death, over hell, over the grave. And again, it's all, all because of Jesus Christ. Joy in the City has produced more than 80 episodes highlighting people and organizations having an impact in our community. We produce programs like our Health and Wellness series, covering topics of the body, mind, and spirit, to inspirational stories from local dreamers and innovators. We want to encourage you to check out our program every Sunday at 1230 on ABC 23, or online at Facebook or YouTube. Now back to our Easter special. For our final segment, I wanted to discuss the unified church as we see it in the Bible. The activity and culture of being of one mind and one purpose. What does that look like in the church today? And are we doing it effectively? Well, I think first of all, you got to go back to what was the message that Jesus preached. Jesus preached the kingdom of God. Prior to that, John preached the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that when Jesus was rose from the dead, in the beginning of the book of Acts, what did he teach? He taught for 40 days to the disciples about the kingdom of God. And so I think we need to understand that in our unity as churches, it is a unified body with different expressions of faith, yet all in that same kingdom. It is the kingdom that unites us, not our denominational uh, similarities, not um, uh, cultural similarities, if you will, um, yet it is the kingdom is the thing that is the unifying factor. Uh, if you think about Jesus and his disciples, what did he do? He brought Simon the Zealot as one of his disciples and Matthew the tax collector 
as one of his disciples. They are juxtaposed uh, different to each other, okay? Zealots killed tax collectors. And yet under the banner of kingdom, under the banner of God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom, those two could come and be unified. And so the message for the church is we may have different expressions and even some different in our uh, non-cardinal doctrines. There's a unity that comes just because we're all part of the kingdom of God. What I see the church doing, especially here in Altoona, is a great sense of coming together as different denominations, different pastors, different uh, people at different places of work, coming together in prayer, coming together in worship. The event last year at the Mishler, the combined worship, was a powerful response. Uh, God is doing something great during these days, and people are working together in ways that hasn't happened in the past. And I think we're going to continue to see walls fall, chains being broken. I think we're going to see churches filled with people ready to receive the Holy Spirit and live into the Great Commission for themselves. It's been a burden on my heart that there was no ministerial group in Altoona when I started ministry here. and. There were various, um, the Ecumenical Council who tried to do some things and there was an effort with, um, and this is still exists, the faith-based round table from Operation Our Town, but they were very focused on different things. There was no um, sense that the churches needed to be working together that had all kind of faded away. I've lived in the area 30 years and those groups existed before 2010, but they had all sort of died out. Um, to see the church coming together, recognizing that we are the body of Christ, individually members of it, and we each have our own part to play, but we need to see that we need to work together as one body. I think that's so vital and so important here in the city. There really is only one church. Uh, there, There's multiple uh, gatherings all across the city, all across the world, but from a biblical perspective, there's one bride of Christ, there's one church, and anyone who declares that Jesus is Lord is a part of the family uh, of God. And when we are unified, uh, it sends a message uh, to the world that God is alive and that God is working, and it gives us a position to share his story. I think there's a difference between unity and uniformity. And I think you know much has been said about that. But I think there's a real difference between unity and uniformity. And there's something about being for somebody without having to do the same thing they're doing. And so I see it a lot like, you know, the military does a whole bunch of things. And, and the, the, the person who's cooking, the prep cook is not the one firing the, the grenades or the, the rockets, right? The, the one firing the rockets is not the one driving the tank. And the one driving the tank is not the one doing medic work. Like to be, to be unified means that we all operate under the same, uh, on the same mission. We're all on the same mission. We're all doing the things that God has put on us to do. But just because you're a medic doesn't mean I have to be a medic. And just because, you know, I drive a tank, which would be kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, but just because I'm driving the tank doesn't mean that you have to drive the tank. That we all do the things that God has created us to do. We all do the things that God has called us to do, and we support one another to the degree that we're able. You know, the medic supports the front line, big time. That doesn't mean everybody on the front line does medic work. So uh, that's what I see. And when I think about the church uh, as unified, I think about all of us saying, hey, what you're doing has value, and it's not what I'm called to do, but I respect and I support what you're doing. And I hope that you would do the same for me. And I think all together, we lock arms and we do our things as we move forward in the mission and in the cause of Christ. And so that, to me, that's, that's unity. It, you don't look like I look and I don't look like you look. And that's a good thing because I'm not that pretty to look at. But, um, but I think we all lock arms and we do this thing together. I think it looks like love. I think it looks like holding each other up within the body, but then that people who are not a part of that can look and say, oh, there's something different about them. Um, I think for so long in Altoona, but I think in general, church has been so segregated. We do our thing and you do your thing. But I think as we become the church body, others can look and say, oh, there's something different there. And they do things very differently, but they seem to really love each other. 
Um, Cause that's not, especially in our world now, people who are very different typically do not get along. And so if we can do that in the body, I think that speaks volumes to the world about who Jesus is and what he can overcome. I think as we look at even Altoona in general here, we've seen things in the past couple of months happen with teens that really make us sad. Uh, but yet it's been a build up and a build up to get us to that point And it's something big has happened. Now, what can we do? We need to get out. We need to, we need to get out and start loving on these teens. Uh, we need to show them that there is something different than what they've grown up in maybe, or what they've seen happening around the world, what they see in Hollywood. Uh, life is different than that. Life doesn't have to be that, that there is joy and there is hope. And there is really only, way, only one way to get that joy and hope. And that is through the God of hope. Romans 15, 13 tells us that the God of hope can give us the joy that we need. And how can we have that? That's by having a relationship with God. You know, a lot of people say, um, we're in a religion. We're not in a religion. We see through Romans 5, 10 that if before someone comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior, they are called enemies of God. But as you get into 1 John 3 and other passages, John 1 tells us that if we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, that we have the power to be called sons of God. Well, that's a relationship there. That's not a religion. It's a relationship with God the Creator, God the Almighty, the one that loved us and sent His Son to die on the cross for us. He loved us so much that that's what He did. And that's what we need to do. Talk about uh, here in the city. We need to show these kids, these teens, these families, the adults. It's not just one segment. We need to show God's love. And if we're showing God's love, it'll turn a city upside down. And I think you could see that, uh, you know, if you look back to uh, the, the, the early church, how they would go in and really the cities would get turned upside down just because they would see God's love uh, shown to them. When Jesus ascended to the Father's right hand and, and had the disciples gather together in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them, I believe that it was Jesus' intention that they went out in a unified front that they went out together. Um, and, and again, some went to different areas, some went to different groups, and, and I'm not speaking down about denominations, I belong to one, but I think uh, what Jesus, Jesus' message for us is, is that the church, the, the, the capital C church comes together to do the work of God. You know, I don't think there's anything that, that portrays the heart of Christ better than a, than a unified church. And the opposite is true too. When we, when we highlight our differences and when the world sees Christians that are bickering and not getting along, I mean, it's, it's just a terrible message to the, to the world. But you know what? If we, if we collectively uh, love and care about each other and love and care about uh, the world, you know, that unity can, uh, it, it's almost a miracle that God can use uh, to bring about uh, change in the lives of other people. To demonstrate this, I pulled in a story from a local church who was going to have to shut their doors for the winter because of extremely high heating costs. They planned to have a spaghetti dinner and a basket raffle to help offset the costs. Pastor Steve Broomball talks more about the specific details. Uh, we were actually looking at the cost about six thousand dollars is what our normal expenses are in the winter time. Okay. And with our and our congregation gives everything they can. Sure. And when they have extra, they give extra. So before we get into this story, I want to show some pictures and some video clips from the day of the spaghetti dinner. Altoona Restoration, Altoona Restoration Church of God, and uh, so what's going on tonight? Uh, we're having a fundraising spaghetti dinner for, uh, so we can try to keep our doors open uh, to pay, pay for a lot for our heating expenses because during this time of the year our electric bill 
Our heating bill is more than every one of our other utilities combined. With a spaghetti dinner and type of fundraiser, what were you hoping that you would get out of that day? Uh, me, I'm the, ult I'm the ultimate pessimist. So I'm like, if we can get two to three, I'm happy. Two or three thousand dollars. Yes, if we can do that, we'll just do a couple other little minor fundraisers along the way, just offset throughout the year, and we'll be good. And uh, so, talk to me a little bit about that day. What did you see God do? I was just, uh, I was overwhelmed because I'm just sitting there like, wow, God is doing some amazing things, and I'm, ex and I'm look, waiting to see what God's going to do next. And then just to see everybody coming in, in there lined up for almost for over two hours, just coming in there and getting food and spaghetti, and I'm just like. Wow, and then donating boss to the baskets and getting the, the, somebody donated a TV, somebody donated a lot of other things. We're just like sitting there like, wow. I can't really put it into words, but I, I'm just thankful for, for the Blair County Pastors Network, for our, all the pastors that we work with, all of our friends, all their churches. So you, you had a need of approximately $6,000 to make it through the winter. You were hoping for between two and $3,000 in yep. this fundraiser. Can you tell us what you come up with? It overshot us by a lot. <laughs> we ended up getting it, getting like all over between nine to ten thousand dollars. Wow! And I was totally. I'm just like, I was blown. <laughs> I was, I couldn't believe it. Like I said, we're just sitting there like, wow, and we're just thanking God. We're just thanking God for what He's done because now we can actually, besides keep our doors open, we can actually do things in the do things for our community. We can just do other things. We can focus on the repairs that we need to do and little things here and there. But now we can actually have comfort, and now we can actually work on how we can outreach our community. It is so exciting to see how churches of our community came together for the cause of Jesus. This is done through prayer, through relationships, and is seen here through support. Today, we have not only talked about the historical aspects of the meaning of Easter, but on how it should be lived out. As we wrap up, one of our pastors is going to give a summary of the true meaning of Easter. So Easter is the time of the year that we celebrate not just the death, but also the resurrection of Jesus. And it's a time where we are reminded of what he did for us out of his act of love. And it's one of these times where we should be thinking about this thing all year, but really around this time, around Easter, it becomes something where we remember what he did for us so that we could be connected to God and be forgiven of our sins and have that pathway to, to relationship with God because of the death of Jesus. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for watching the Easter special brought to you by ABC 23, Fox 8, and many pastors from our community. Let me encourage you to watch other episodes of Joy in the City each Sunday at 1230 on ABC or visit us on Facebook or YouTube. Let's continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ in all we do and be encouraged because God is moving in our city. God is on the